Good evening from Israel. My name is Moria Ben David and I'm the ZFA Israel Office Director in Israel. As you know, Jerusalem is almost always in the headlines and almost always in people's imaginations. We mourn Jerusalem's destruction and we celebrate its rebuilding. Two weeks ago, we celebrated Yom Atzmaut and in two weeks time, we'll celebrate Yom Yerushalayim. So today is a perfect time to speak with Jerusalem's Deputy Mayor, Fleur Hassan Akhum. Fleur was born in England, but raised in Gibraltar. I really must ask you about that. And is passionate about her adopted city, Jerusalem. She has been on the city council for six years and in that time has worked to make Jerusalem a center of investment and diplomacy, including encouraging countries to locate their embassies in Israel's capital. Since the moment Israel signed a normalization agreement with the United Arab Emirates, Fleur has also been active in making the business ties with that country as tight as possible. We're going to talk about all this and more. So welcome, Fleur. Thank you so much, Moria. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's really, it's, it's an honor and, and a pleasure. And I must say that I'm super excited for this uh, conversation that we have ahead. Um, I'd, like to speak, I'd like to start actually with asking, you know, as someone who didn't grow up or was born in Jerusalem and, and had the choice to, to move to Jerusalem and make Aliyah, um, what is Jerusalem for you? What do you really love about this city? Well, Jerusalem, I think, is, first of all, it's not just the capital city of the state of Israel. It's not just the largest city in Israel. It's also the capital city of the Jewish people, wherever they are um, around the world. It's where we've been, it's our first capital as a Jewish nation, two and a half thousand years ago. And it also represents the diversity of the different tribes of Israel from two and a half thousand years ago. You know, this city was built by King David. Uh, King David was not from the city, he was from Judea, Judea is Hebron. And he opted not to create the capital of the Jewish kingdom in Hebron because it belonged to one tribe, Judea. He wanted to pick neutral ground um, so that all tribes could feel at home. And so I see Jerusalem as the capital city of the Jewish people, a city that every Jew should find and should feel at home. Wow, beautiful. Do you have like a specific place or a site where you feel like it, you know, capsulate all of, you know, what you said as like a place that you see all these different tribes come together? Um, I think that um, there's many places in the city where all, everybody comes together. Um, but I think the fact that it's normal for us, I think that people don't understand really quite how to together most of the time in peace and harmony. You know, when you go to my local gym and you see Arab women and ultra Orthodox women in the same Zumba class, that's living in a shared society, but nobody sees that. Certainly the press uh, is not what's going to be, uh, that's not what they're going to be showcasing. Right. I actually thought about it like, you know, I guess that you host a lot of people from different places in the world to come to Jerusalem and get, you know, get a bit of a glimpse of what it's like to live there. Um, where do you take them? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I think Jerusalem is a beautiful, um, I think it's like a beautiful convergence of different things that to some people seem contradictory. So past and future, uh, heaven and earth, um, and, and east and west. I think that's the convergence, everything happening in Jerusalem. And so, you know, when you take people, they have to experience the culinary, they have to experience the culture, they have to experience the art, and they have to just take in the beautiful views and walk around the city. Um, I don't think anybody leaves Jerusalem not kind of, um, not kind of fallen in love with the city. I, I, it's just a beautiful city, but it's also a city where many contradictions seem to kind of live together and people realize maybe they're not contradictions after all. 100%. I, you know, it's so true that, you know, sometimes things that you see outside, but when you, when you experience it on the day to day basis, you don't see the, you know, you don't see the clashes or the conflicts as much. Well, um, you know, it, you know it, it, Jerusalem is a place where, you know, when you go to Tel Aviv, which is a wonderful city, and I love 
I love going to Tel Aviv. Um, you know, most people don't really know any Arabs, for example. In Jerusalem, we all do. We all work together every day. Uh, and so that, to me, you know, you can talk about peace all you like, but if you don't know the people that you want to make peace with, then what's the point of talking about it? And in Jerusalem, we don't have to curate meetings between Jews and Arabs. We live together. <laughs> It just happens, yeah, in the yeah. supermarket or in the, in the movies. Um, but really talking about, you know, the, the fact that there is a whole variety of different, different communities living in the same city. How, did you, how do you integrate different communities? Is it something that, you know, you work on in the municipality to make sure that all these different communities, Haredis, Arabs, you know, that sometimes can be completely different or maybe similar, how do you integrate them um, into the city in you know, different aspects? The main thing um, that I'm working on as one of my portfolios is economic development, is to integrate them into um, quality employment. I believe that when you work with somebody, then all the barriers come down because everybody realizes they're just a person just like you. And so um, integration of ultra-Orthodox into the workplace is not an easy thing because we're essentially going against their leadership. Um, they won't let, you know, won't teach core curriculum studies to boys, for example. And so less will integrate into the workplace. So we're trying to get around that. With Arabs as well, their Palestinian leadership, uh, is, it's in their interest not to have integration of Arabs in the city into the high-tech workspaces because that you know limits their power. That uh, gives people opportunity that they don't. Uh, they're less angry and they're willing to normalize. And so, the trick is to go to the people directly and not trust their leadership, whose main interest is to keep themselves in power and not advance their population. Wow. So it actually, I actually wanted to ask about it later on, but you're just like you know bringing it up. Um, I was really curious to hear. How do you how do you access first of all if you're working with the leadership of every community and if not as you said like you know you're trying to kind of bypass them how do you access to the community to that you know to the people and not you know not through the leadership of the community I guess that it also has so many obstacles on the way to kind of you know reach out to just you know, just the, the normal people who, as you said, they want to work, they want to live their own, their lives peacefully. And well, the thing that's very, very strong in Jerusalem is civil society. We have, I mean, brace for this, we have the largest numbers of NGO per capita in Jerusalem than anywhere in the world. In other words, everybody thinks that they can um, make the world a better place and everybody creates a nonprofit organization to help them do that. Um, and so it's very easy for us to work with civil society, with local leadership, with community council leadership, both in the ultra-Orthodox communities and the Arab communities, um, and work directly with them. This mayor is very engaged in the affairs of East Jerusalem. He meets with local Arab leaders once a month, uh, helps them with everything they need, has given unprecedented budgets to East Jerusalem. And so when there's goodwill, there's a really a way of getting it done for the sake and for the improvement of people's lives. It's amazing. I actually, I wanted to ask, you know, we are now facing, um, there's a lot of tension lately in, in yes, Temple really. Mount. Um, and, you know, talking about East Jerusalem, I guess that it's something that really, you know, affects what's going on in this side of the city. Uh, what's happening in Temple Mount, um, we had a funeral uh, yesterday of uh, Shirina, uh, Shirina Buakla, the journalist of, uh, of um, Al Jazeera, that didn't look good at all in terms of, you know, how the police handled um, this funeral. How does it affect the community when things like these happen? I think that in every community, and especially with East Jerusalem, where you have Hamas entrenched into, um, into the villages around here, um, they are they are purposely um, creating and curating these situations to um, to have confrontations with the police. They did it on Temple Mount a few weeks ago. You know, people three hundred thousand worshippers prayed in Temple Mount peacefully throughout the Ramadan, 
And then a few bad eggs come in to try and create a confrontation with the police and put out a very manipulative and completely false narrative that Israel is somehow blocking freedom of worship on Temple Mount. Not only are we not blocking freedom of worship on Temple Mount, we're actually actively facilitating it by putting buses in every single checkpoint and bringing people to Temple Mount to pray. Uh, and so these the municipalities, the, the municipality is, is the government, the transport it? ministry. The transport ministry is funding buses from checkpoints to Temple Mount, letting people, um, letting people um, come coming and praying up on Temple Mount, actively facilitating. Uh, we put six million shekels towards budgets for cultural events during Ramadan. We're talking about clowns and children's entertainers and sweets. We had a drone show one night. We're doing everything we can to make sure that everybody has their freedom of worship. We've refurbished such a large uh, amount of the old city right now, Christian quarter, Muslim quarters, you know, anything else is basically a manipulative libelous claims in order but, to but you know, but, the Muslim population around the world into thinking that somehow Al-Aqsa is under attack when there could be nothing further from the truth. So my question is, if we know that, you know, this is what Hamas does, why do we fall into their hands and and basically or into the you know and 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 instead of like making ourselves look better or look like you know the absolute truth we're just playing you know m making sure that it looks it just looks bad on us is it we know that sure Hamas is running us when we go and defend their own mosque from the hooligans and we go into the mosque because they're walking around in shoes they've got explosive metal bars and rocks we're not here to make ourselves look good. We're here to have a peaceful country and to protect ourselves from people who want to destroy us. You know, how we look is not a priority. Maybe it should be, maybe we should do better. Believe me, I'm the one out there fighting with all the international media about this, but that's not, our priority should not be how we look. Our priority should be how our lives are here and nothing else. Thank you. I, I would actually, I'm, I have here a question from the crowd and I'd like to, to ask it. Um, she, I just got something about your initiative with Palestinian Samar Sinjlawi from David's- Samar Sinjlawi, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got, a, like I said, we, we work a lot with local leaders in East Jerusalem. Samar started off uh, as a bitter rival of mine on Twitter and in other media platforms. And today we're putting together a program where we're bringing in uh, Real Madrid to train 3,200 uh, Israeli and uh, Arab kids uh, in football uh, this summer. So we're very excited about that. I'm always with my hands outstretched for people who want to make the reality better for all parties involved. That's beautiful. Um, you know, we're, we're now, it's, it, we're two weeks, um, ahead from uh, uh, before actually Yom Yom Shalim. And I guess that, you know, because of what's going on now, um, do you prepare differently? Do you prepare for any incidents that might happen? Are the celebrations gonna be, gonna look different this year? Well, for the last few years, we've been rerouting uh, the Jerusalem March um, so that it doesn't go through the Damascus gates and not cause unnecessary provocations. There are some people who think that we shouldn't be rerouting. There are some people think that we shouldn't have the march at all. I think it's important to celebrate our moments and not be led by a narrative of our enemies. And so, yes, I think the march should go ahead. And I think, yes, we should be sensitive and do it in, uh, go through Jaffa Gate instead of uh, Damascus Gate is not gonna, you know, it's, it's, I don't think it's giving in on anything very, um, very crucial, but I definitely think we should have the march because our celebrations should not be hindered by uh, people wanting to quell our celebrations of a united city, which is the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. But can you envision like having all communities, including the Eastern side of Jerusalem, celebrating Yom Yerushalayim? Or it's something that will forever be kind of separated between the Jewish, uh, the Jewish communities and the Arab communities? 
Well, we're celebrating the reunification of the city and the sovereignty coming to us from Jordanian illegal occupation between 48 and 67. I don't think any of the Palestinians in East Jerusalem will want to celebrate that, even though they should be, because we've actually brought some prosperity and peace to the, uh, to the city. Um, I don't envision that. I don't want them to celebrate. I don't need them to celebrate with us. I just need them to be respectful of our celebrations the way that we're respectful of theirs. How, how are we respectful you know, to their celebrations? Or for example, today is Yom Anakba, like it's the Nakba day. Is there anything like, you know, special that you do or you cater um, to, the Eastern, uh, to the Eastern side in this day? No, of course not. First of all, we Ramadan is the main celebration. We put a lot of money, like I told you, into it. We did a lot of wonderful things on Ramadan, and we're very proud of that. Nakba Day is a day called the Disaster Day. What's the disaster? The creation of the State of Israel. So, of course, we're not going to give budgets for them celebrating, uh, for them, you know, doing a, a marking, kind of Holocaust marking, day. Yeah. Marking yeah. a Holocaust Day, which involves our... There wouldn't be a Nakba Day if we wouldn't have been here. And... Uh, and uh, and so, of course not, absolutely not. Ultimately, we are who we are. We should be proud that we returned to our homeland after two and a half thousand years. This is a city built by King David. And this is a city that became the capital of the Jewish people before anybody else's capital. It's never been anybody else's capital. And so uh, and so we should be celebrating our, our presence here and our return to Zion. Um, and I have many Arab friends who should respect just like I respect uh, their celebrations, not their commemorations of a disaster or a Holocaust. I actually wanna, I wanna move to like a, a bit of an optimistic topic about the Abraham Accords, uh, that I know that you, you have a very special bond, you know, with the Emirates um, um, since, I guess, even before I established this forum. Can you elaborate a little bit about what you've been doing, um, you know, as, as a kind of a, uh, an effect of, of the fact that we have normalization with these uh, these countries? Well, absolutely. It's been really the most, um, the biggest paradigm shift in, um, in regional peace and diplomacy that we've had in decades. Um, because not only, um, basically, essentially what's happened is that we've said what, what the Abraham Accords means is that there's no more Arab-Israeli conflict. There's a conflict with the Palestinians, there may be a conflict with Iran, Lebanon, but there's no Arab-Israeli conflict because half the Arab world is willing to say, you know, we, we want peace with Israel. Um, and the Palestinians have dragged this long enough, 72 years, 74 years longer uh, with, you know, rejectionism, with overtures of peace again and again that they've rejected and with a culture of victimization that's not getting them anywhere. And so it's been absolutely game-changing. I created, the, um, I co-founded the UAE Israel Business Council um, two months before the announcement of normalization because myself and my co-founder Dorian Barak realized that there was a lot of under the radar normalization going on and we wanted to give it a framework. Within, uh, we didn't understand or imagine that um, peace was gonna be announced so quickly. And when it was, we created the first online platform, the most important online platform um, for businesses between UAE and Israel. And within a few short weeks after that, my, my uh, friend and colleague, Justine Zwelling and I created the Gulf Israel Women's Forum because we believe that for a lasting, sustainable and warm peace, women should be leading, women from all around the Middle East. And today I've got women on my forum from Saudi who haven't even made peace with us yet. And yet they're very interested in jumping on this bandwagon of women leading uh, a warm peace in the Middle East so that we have a better future for our children. And so that's given me an enormous amount of hope as what it, this could look like, what peace could look like uh, here in the Middle East. That's beautiful. Is there anything like, you know, in the pipelines in terms of things that you're gonna do together and specifically in Jerusalem? Cause you know, when I heard about it in the first time, I was like, well, Jerusalem for me doesn't look like a place of where you connect business businesses together or you know uh, high tech and technology. Um, it's as if more for a Tel Aviv uh, Tel Aviv area, and it's kind of a it's it's a new thing that you're bringing. Is there anything that is actually happening on the ground in Jerusalem uh, together with the Emirates? 
Well, first of all, Jerusalem is home to the best academic institutions in the country. And seven years ago, I was one of the people who started a group um, to try and create an innovation ecosystem in the city of Jerusalem so we can take our rightful place at the capital of the startup nation. Um, today, we have a third of all biotech in the country is coming out of Jerusalem. Um, the, the three largest, sexiest uh, areas of innovation today is coming from Jerusalem, and that is self-driving vehicles, lab-made meat, and all sorts of other sort of animal products where you won't have to kill animals eventually, um, you know, uptain um, energy and biotech solutions. So Jerusalem is very much at the heart of the startup nation. It's where the innovation, where the most exciting innovation is actually coming from. There's a secret source in Jerusalem, uh, which is called diversity. And when you have a lot of diverse people around an idea, the idea always gets better. And so we're very much a uh, leading part of the startup nation and we'll continue to grow. And that's a good thing because that's how we can keep young and uh, diverse population in the city of Jerusalem. I must say that it's really inspiring to hear you look you're so passionate about what you what you do and how you talk about the city that it's uh it's it's uh like I'm I, I'm I'm getting emotional as someone who is uh, you know living very close to, to Jerusalem and Jerusalem is very close to my heart. Um you mentioned before the fact that you you try to bring women to to this table. And I saw a quote of yours that you know you said once that if we're not going to have at least 50% of women in the um, in the decision making you know table so the world is not going to be balanced um, do you actively work to you know also create this change in Jerusalem and do you feel like Jerusalem is going to this direction so yeah i uh, first of all in terms of women in the workplace i'm a co-founder of a program called fem forward which basically um, brings women who are in junior high tech positions and tries uh, works to propel them into senior management positions because there's a lot of women starting out almost equal to men in high tech. And somehow uh, when it gets to senior management positions, the overwhelming amount of, of uh, managers are men. And so I created a program where I'm very proud to have Arab women, Haredi women, uh, secular women, uh, all of them, 65% of them uh, have um, pay rises and job promotions after the, our program. And the essence of our program is not just teaching skills, but also um, connecting women to mentors. And I believe that role models and mentors are very, very important to women. Um, um, women have all everything that they need in order to be at the top of their game. They just need a little bit of self-confidence and somebody telling them, you can do it, you can go for it, you're allowed. Um, and this program has been extremely successful as a result of that. Yes, and then I've got my golf as well. Women's Forum, of course, pushing women, uh, the leaders. I mentor at any given moment, a uh, few women in politics also. I think it's very important for women to get into the political fold so that they can be at every single decision-making table. And decisions are just better when the when the the table is diverse decisions are better and not just for women for everybody and that's what people don't seem to understand they think that i'm talking about a better world for women i'm talking about a better world for everybody when women are in the decision making table i definitely second that do you see any uh, do you see like a mayor a, a woman mayor that is going to be anytime soon in, in Jerusalem? Or is it like a unfortunately, tradition? Unfortunately not, because the ultra-Orthodox are 50% of the electorate, even though they're only 25% of the population, because they vote, vote in double the numbers. Um, and for ultra-Orthodox, it's going to be very difficult uh, for them to back a woman. And without at least one ultra-Orthodox group, it's very difficult to be elected um, as mayor of the city. Yeah, so it's going to take a while. Wow. Okay. And do I'm, I'm going back to the, you know, the technological high tech um, um, whole, you know, initiatives that you're trying to push. I also heard recently that you're trying to um, create a technological center in the Eastern city. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more about it? Um, How does it work? The innovation. Yeah. Well, se well, seven years ago, we started um, building a small, a first accelerator. An accelerator is where startups can get all the skills that they need and all the connections uh, in order to raise money for their ideas. Um, today, there's a 
ecosystem, there's a basically a, there's an accelerator in every single college or university in the city. Uh, so we've come a long way. Uh, we've done a great job in connecting industry and academia. And uh, the results are that we have three, four times the startups that we had six, seven years ago and four times the investment. And so we're really pushing things forward. And every, and also we're going into education in schools and bringing technology as part of education in schools and high schools. And that's also a very important part of how we train kids for the future careers. And, and the staff like that, you know, the educators, the education system is like, is, is engaged. Do they want it? Do they want it? Do they embrace it? They do. Most of them do. And then, uh, in ultra orthodox schools, we find ways around it um, in order for us, or we go to the alternative schools that teach core curriculum. We try and also find a way around it. I actually, because because you you, you discussed a lot about the fact that you have a variety of, of communities, and you know, in the end, you're one municipality. And I guess my question is, how do you cater to such different communities all at once? Or maybe you have like something that is very basic for everyone, because everyone, you know, in the end have the same needs and the same challenges, and you just, you know, cater directly to everyone the same, or you see each and every community as, you know, as its own, and you cater especially and specifically address their own needs. So the city is, the city is a, a, a community of communities. And so the best way to work with everybody is to work with the grassroots work with their local leadership. You know, we don't know better than their local leadership, where, where it be Haredi or where it be Arab. Um, the, the point is finding people who are like-minded and open-minded enough to be able to work, to bring prosperity to their people. And we have lots of partners and that's the way to do it. It's not imposing ourselves or paternalizing uh, anybody or patronizing anybody. It's working with the local leaders who are trying to work for positive change. Sister, like, can you uh, maybe give an example for a challenge that you had uh, with the community that you tried to, you know, push for something and they didn't like it or they wanted it or kind of a challenge that you had with the leadership or with the people of a specific community? Well, you know, the, the main challenges that we have, especially with the Arab community, is that they can't be seen to be working with us uh, too much. So we're very discreet about how we give funding and how we fund certain programs so that they don't go, you know, they, they're in, the leaders that work with us, they're in a difficult position because they're getting pressured by the Palestinian Authority um, and the radical groups not to work with us. So it's always, the, the challenge is always how do we keep it uh, discreet enough to get the job done um, so that they don't get, um, they don't get, you know, kickback from, they don't get, uh, you know, pressure from their own leadership. It's the same way with ultra orthodox in a way. How do we work with the leaders so that they don't get, uh, you know, negative pressure from their own leadership? Um, look, I can give you a very positive example. During COVID, um, yeah. the Arabs and Jews in the city had a positive, had a uh, had a common enemy. Uh, we were all fighting the virus. We came together. We worked together uh, to provide to help for the poor families that needed help, food packages for special needs families that needed extra help in the house, um, Corona families uh, that we had to get to the Corona hotel so they wouldn't infect the entire family. We did campaigns, we worked with local leadership in every community, we were creative. Uh, we did separate campaigns in Arabic and Yiddish, Hebrew for the ultra Orthodox, for the regular public. So we did entertainment on trucks when people couldn't leave their homes. We had music trucks going around, one in Arabic, one in uh, for Haredi music, one for the rest of us. So I think that was a really wonderful example of how a city can come together to fight a common, uh, common enemy. Like how to be also sensitive to, you know, even to language, mentality, et cetera. Absolutely, absolutely. What is, Claire, what is your baby? Something you're proud of? And you know, in this time that you've oh, been I've got, I've got too many things to have one baby <laughs> um, going on. Look, the women's stuff is important to me. Empowering women in the Arab sector is very important to me because uh, women, um, be because of the particular community, women end up falling behind. 
And I believe that women's leadership is very important to advance a warm, sustainable, um, you know, shared society. I think women can do that better. Uh, we, we just do. Uh, we, we can submit ourselves to a higher cause quicker and build bridges quicker and bond. Um, and so I think the women's leadership between Arab and Jewish women is a big thing for me. I think that we can be the part of the solution. Um, and economic development, all the things I do for economic development, giving people equal opportunity is where it's at. And that's how we are going to create a better society. Amazing. I just got a, a question from uh, the crowd. What priority is given to education that causes the divide between Arabs and Jews? Do you support multicultural programs? Absolutely, I do. I mean, the program that we're doing for sports this summer is a multicultural program. It's for Jewish kids and Arab kids. Um, and, uh, and I think that it's important um, to put these things together. I think that, listen, I don't think we have to, the beauty of Jerusalem is that we don't have to curate anything. It's not, you know, we, we live in the same city. And when you go to university, um, in any given class, there's going to be lots of Arab and, and Jewish uh, people. Right. And so I don't believe in these kind of fakely curated meetings where everybody feels good about themselves, but nothing gets done. I would rather just people have great jobs. When you work with somebody, when you study with somebody, you begin to understand that people are people. And that's the best way to move forward and not these kind of fakely curated meetings where everybody hugs, feels good, but nothing actually happens. Um, so that's how I feel about that. Somebody's asking, do I think Iran will try and threaten and derail the Abraham Accords? They're trying all the time. This is what the war last May was about. This is what the Temple Mount stuff is about. They're trying all the time to divide Jews from the rest of the Arab world, to vilify Jews in front of the Muslim world. They're trying. But I think our Gulf partners are smart enough to understand the manipulation going on. I have another question actually regarding the project that the city council does. Do you believe that it can, you know, the projects that you do can pave the way to, uh, to peace or is Jerusalem kind of an obstacle um, for peace? On the contrary, I think that the uh, Jerusalem is the laboratory for the solution because the challenges are its biggest challenges here because we're so diverse. We're doubly as diverse as the rest of the country. So in the rest of the country, ultra Orthodox are 12% and Jerusalem is 25%. The rest of the country, Arabs are 20%, it's 40%. So we're double the intensity of the average of the state of Israel. And we're also a mirror to the possible future demography of the state of Israel. And so therefore the models for shared society have to come out of here. And Jerusalem, as I said earlier, is the capital, the NGO capital of the world. We're also the capital of social innovation. And this social innovation is where these models for a shared society are going to come from. Amazing. There's tons of questions. Like it's uh, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick a few more. Um, has tourism returned to pre-COVID levels? You're also in charge of like yeah, yeah, you're also in charge of the tourism uh, aspect in, in the municipality. I am in charge of tourism. And we thank God about a good Pesach, the second part of Pesach, because of the problems with Ramadan on Temple Mount was a little quiet. Um, Jerusalem has suffered extreme in an extreme amount from COVID because a good chunk of our income comes from foreign tourism. So we're hoping that by the summer we will have pre-COVID levels. We're, we're not far now, but it's going to take a while. Um, what plans are put in place to stop the wave of terror happening in Israel? Someone asked me. Well, you know, as we always do, we have to combination of intelligence and weeding out and smoking out the troublemakers, the radical groups, and, you know, enhance security and enhance alertness until we get rid of it, as we always do, and we will. Beautiful. Um, I just, I, I also uh, wanted to, to move a little bit to your whole, you know, proactive steps you're taking uh, to move some embassies that are not located in Jerusalem into Jerusalem. Can you tell us a little bit about developments in this arena um, in the nearest future? There's two types of countries at the moment moving their embassies or moving you know, serious offices to Jerusalem. And that is some Eastern European countries and some Latin American countries. 
Uh, so after the United States moved, we have Guatemala, Honduras. Um, we have, I met with Ecuador this morning, which is very invested now. We've got Serbia, Croatia, um, uh, Hungary, very friendly to our countries, uh, Kosovo's embassies here. And so we have to, in, you know, keep strengthening our relations and, and working on, on more moves. It's, it's ridiculous for anybody to think that, um, that Jerusalem is not the capital or will not remain the capital. In any peace deal you can imagine, Jerusalem will always remain the capital. And so we have to do better in getting, in getting countries. I think that if we even got a big country like Brazil, for example, that would be really amazing. Um, and other uh, countries in Latin America may follow suit. Uh, Europe is gonna be tougher, but Eastern Europe is, uh, is putting their money where their mouth is. And there really are, some of them are, are making big moves to, 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 to move here. But what's really like, I thought that it's more something that the government is you know, involved in and yes. it's, you know, in, in what way is the municipality involved? You know, is it more in the technical part of like, you know, logistics, how to move, um, yes. where, where to put the, where to put the embassy or, or also to kind of, you know, convince li like different, different uh, um, countries to move their embassies to, to Jerusalem? Our role is more logistical, of course. Um, but, you know, at any given opportunity, I always, uh, I always uh, use the opportunity to try and convince people to move. Uh, you know, there's a foreign minister who has a higher status than me, but uh, but uh, I always make sure to uh, make people understand that this is the only way forward. Amazing. I, I'm going back to a topic that we talked about, but I see that, you know, uh, there's a question from the crowd about it. But what exactly happened in the funeral last uh, yesterday? Like TV... Yeah. Yeah. Showing is really again, this is the same, it's the same TV. pattern as the Alexa. Okay, it's the same thing. You send you send radicals and rabble rousers to uh go to these things. They politicize this woman's death. I mean, we don't even know if it I mean they they, they could have killed her themselves. She's also a Christian, she wasn't even a Muslim, and they're trying to bury her quickly so that they can hide the evidence of the fact that it may well have been their bullet that killed her. Uh but again. You know, they send rabble rousers, they start attacking the police. And what do the videos catch? The police defending themselves. So you're basically saying that it's not a, it's not something that we, you know, we, you, you believe that we could have handled it better or you think that we did Look, the right you can thing? always handle it better and it's very easy to judge from our very comfortable armchairs. But ultimately when you're a police, in, you know, in the middle of a riot, being attacked and thrown big boulders of five kilo stones and you hit back and that's what the police cameras, you can always do better, you know, but these things happen very quickly and I'm nobody to sit here in judgment of the police who are doing the best jobs that they can to defend the public, the, you know, the public space. And so I will not judge, things can always be done better. Um, and again, we are working against a whole, industry of of of, uh, of 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 media that is whole purpose is to make us look like the aggressive occupiers it's a whole industry uh, that we're up against and we don't do a good enough job believe me i know we don't but you have to understand nevertheless that this is an industry against us to libel us and to make us look bad and to delegitimize um israel and so once you understand that that's the lens you're looking at it Anything is very easy to make us look bad. All we're doing is working in self-defense. All we've ever done in Israel since the beginning and even before the establishment of states of Israel is act in self-defense. That's all we do. I wanna I wanna move a little bit again to uh, to talk about opportunities. You know, we if you look at the next decade of of how Jerusalem is gonna look like, you know, the having the light ray the the light train. Um, I know that you're doing a lot in terms of transportation in, in Jerusalem and making it a bit a bit better or more than a bit better. Um, what are the opportunities that Jerusalem can bring, you know, to, to the population that lives in Jerusalem or to attract like different kinds of populations into, um, into the city? For example, you know, when I was in university, now I learned in Hebrew. So there was always a talk about like trying to attract young people 
you know, to, to stay in Jerusalem or to live in Jerusalem and that they won't, you know, move to Tel Aviv. Is it something that is still on your agenda, you know, in terms of a well, Why do you think we built up a whole innovation ecosystem so that people, young people would have good jobs and wouldn't have to run to Tel Aviv for good jobs? That's exactly why we built it. And that's exactly why they're staying. So what else are the opportunities for people who live in, you know, aside from the technology and, you know, trying to put some, you know, jobs in Jerusalem, what else is there? That someone well, we have like the biggest cul cultural budgets of any city in the country. And we do a lot to support and fund local artists. So keeping the creative classes in Jerusalem is also part of our agenda. And we do a lot towards that. Beautiful. Um, I actually wanted to, I'm taking more, more questions from the crowd because there is the, there's more that I get. Um, how, do you, how do you personally feel about President Biden wanting to reopen Palestinian embassy in Jerusalem? Well, I think it's wrong and it's something that um, should be negotiated between the parties and not have, uh, and not have the, the Americans or our best allies, but not have them, uh, you know, um, negotiating anything for us. The, the negotiations have to be between the two parties and they would be creating something on the ground that hasn't really existed. You, you don't have any other city in the world where you have an embassy and a consulate in the same city. They now have an embassy here, so it makes absolutely no sense for them to also open a consulate in the same city. It doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Why should Jerusalem be different? So basically, like as a municipality, that's the stance of the municipality to oppose to something like that? Absolutely. Um, I, I do want to talk a, bit, a little bit about the comparison between Tel Aviv and Yerushalayim. Um, you know, just give, give a bit more pride of, of, of Jerusalem and comparing to Tel Aviv. How is the traffic you think is, uh, is, is changing or going to change? Is it going to be better than Tel Aviv? Um, I know that you do a lot in, you know, with the transportation area. Can you also elaborate about that? Well, we're also the, um, the, trans the most advanced transport city in the country. We had the light rail before anybody else, and now we're building the second and third line. So the idea is that the whole of Jerusalem will be accessible by light rail. And now that we have a heavy train from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in half an hour, you can be in, uh, once you arrive in Jerusalem with the, with the whole light rail network, you'll be able to get anywhere in Jerusalem in 10, 15 minutes. And so that's huge. And that is uh, something which uh, Tel Aviv has only started working on now and it'll take them years uh, to get anywhere near us. The idea is that in the future, the private car will be a thing of the past. That's the idea. We're very far from it, but we will get there before any other city in the country. Wow. Do you, don't you think that the fact that you have like historic findings in Jerusalem and you know that we are basically layers upon layers of, of history doesn't it kind of uh, put a lot of difficulties to create, you know, to, to have the light train and to um, to kind of change or, or yeah, re remodel the city in a way? Yes, no, look, ultimately, everything that we do, um, the antiquities authorities are always there to check that, um, you know, we're not damaging anything or any discoveries. Um, that's very strict here. But I think that making the city accessible for all is definitely a very, very um, worthy aim. An important one, yeah. I, I wanted to ask, I know that you are, you, you at least define yourself uh, the T, like religious. Um, and I wanted to ask if, th does it help you with the Haredi community in terms of, you know, getting them engaged to initiatives that you're trying to push um, or different things and projects that you have in the city. How does it work with the Haredi community? I don't think the Haredi, in, in, in the Haredi world, uh, they don't see me as any different to a secular person normally. I mean, there are exceptions, of course. When you're not, you're either Haredi or non-Haredi, do you know what I mean? It doesn't matter where you are on the orthodox scale. Uh, the fact that I'm a feminist is already something that they have a very difficult thing uh, to cope with. They don't really get it. Um, so, um, look, I, I think that, uh, I, I don't think it's a question of orthodox or non-orthodox. I think it's a question of personality. Uh, I, half my family are uh, a Haredi. And so um, I know how to um, engage and talk to any, anybody um, and to try and find 
um, ways of collaborating, even though it seemingly seems like you can't. Um, and so I have a lot of, I, I'm treated with a lot of respect by the ultra Orthodox city council members and deputy mayors. I have no problem with them. And in fact, I've worked very nicely with many of them on many issues for many years. You mentioned in, you know, beforehand that you're trying, because you understand that the leadership sometimes in these communities aren't easier. Sometimes they're a bit of an obstacle. You kind of get to the people themselves, but how do you access, you know, it's not that the Haredi community, they have like social media, they have Facebook or, or WhatsApp. How do you actually get, you know, get to these people who want to, you know, want to have jobs, who maybe want to integrate into um, um, the society, into, into things that the city, the, the services that the city gives them? Um, how do you access, you know, to inside, you know, this community that is very closed and very shuttered in a way from everyone else? But every, but every Haredi now, I think the big issue within the Haredi society is that all the young people have got uh, phones. Um, so WhatsApp is actually very, very, very common in the Haredi community, especially amongst the people who want to modernize. Um, and so I don't think it's difficult to access them. But again, like I said earlier, it's all about their own leaders uh, that you work with, their own uh, grassroots leadership. And there's lots of that, lots and lots, especially the younger communities of the Haredi. Look, there are people who are closed off and they will remain closed off, but there are a lot of people who are opening themselves up. And these are the people that we speak to and these are the people that we work with. Um, I, I have another question here from the crowd. If a close friend was visiting Jerusalem for the first time from overseas, what are the what are your top five must see places that you would recommend? Oh my God, I have so many, but like well, first of all, the Shuk. Uh, I would do a day trip and a night trip to the Shuk because it's like two different places. And in the day, it's a bustling, you know, market, and at night, it's a bustling nightlife where the stalls turn into bars, and it's a very cool thing to experience. I would go to the Israel Museum. Uh, to see uh, past, present, and future, um, especially the the um, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the model of what Jerusalem looked like in Second Temple times, and just to give you a real sense of where you are, I would go to um, to the old city, of course, and walk around all the different quarters, um, and go to either the Kotel tunnels or the City of David, or the Tower of David Museum. So, uh, and if you have time, go to the first station uh, to have a nice meal and, and, and soak up the culture. And so there's lots and lots to do in Jerusalem. That's never been a problem to find what to do, but that's what I would do. Uh, definitely. Uh, speaking about, you know, culinary and like beautiful uh, uh, restaurants or places to go, and there is that beautiful coffee place actually called Zarifa. And it's in uh, Katamon. I don't know if you know about it, Fleur. I know. I've been there a few times. My daughter even worked there for a while. Oh, really? <laughs> so uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful place that usually a coffee place that has also great coffee. That's for the uh, people in Australia that really appreciate great coffee. So uh, it's a great place to go to. And, uh, and of course, um, I would definitely go to Hebrew. For me, it's uh, and, and the botanical garden that is there that for me is, uh, you know, it's, it's a place where it opens your heart and open your soul. And, and as you said, like you see the people, which is also something that I think, um, I think is, is important to just, just get the feel of Jerusalem um, and smell the smells of that, you know, the beautiful trees, the oran trees that you have in, uh, in these areas. Um, someone asked here, the Museum of Tolerance, do you recommend? Not open yet. When it opens, and we know what is in it, perhaps. <laughs> when is it going to be open? Do I know? have no idea. I I think it's still like a year away, possibly. I mean, the building is finished, and we've had a few events there. But uh, I, I was with those folks a couple of weeks ago. We still don't. Um, I think one last question uh, for me is uh, where do you see yourself? You know, for you, you've done a lot, six years in, in the municipality. Um, and usually, you know, there's always the question, where do, you, where do you impact more in Israel? In a place like the government or the Knesset, or is it more in the municipality, in the local 
in the local, uh, in the city itself, where you can see, you know, you see straight your, your outcome, um, but where do you see yourself in a few years' time? Um, that's a good question. I don't really know yet. I, I, I know that in, I know that I can be um, very influential here in the city, um, but my heart is really in the international diplomacy space. Um, so eventually I'm assuming that at some point I'll make the move to national politics. Just not sure when yet. And in what, in what a framework or, you know, party or it's still, a, it's still no, far I'm, away? No, I'm already, I'm a central committee member of the uh, Likud party. Um, and that's my political home. Um, it's a very diverse party. People don't understand how diverse it actually is. Um, and yeah, I, I found, I found a, I found my place there and it'll be with that, within that framework. How do you, how are you going to celebrate Yom Yerushalayim in two weeks time? Well, I've got about five different talks <laughs> that I'm giving, <laughs> um, and hopefully we'll do some partying as well uh, in the beautiful, in the, in the um, Tower of David Museum, they always do a beautiful party on Yom Yerushalayim uh, and it's a lot of fun, yeah. So uh, celebrating, celebrating, okay. The miracle that is our wonderful city and their it's reunification. Your your family lives in Jerusalem, right? Your kids. That's part, that's part of the uh, criteria for being deputy mayor. <laughs> right. No, you are, but like also and your kids, how old they are? Um, I've got four kids, 20, 18, uh, 15, and 12. Um, yeah, we're all here. Beautiful. Um I must say that for me, for years, like, you know, I've been uh, in Yom Yerushalayim, coming to Yerushalayim, coming with, uh, um, when I used to, you know, not live in Jerusalem, but coming especially for this day to celebrate and to, to raise the flag up high. And, um, and, and, you know, in two weeks time, it's a, it's a question how, how and with who I'm going to, definitely I'm going to come, but the question is like, you know, with the family, without the family, is there anything really like a great like place for a family, for a family holiday? So I wanted to ask, is there like, you know, family programs in, uh, in your Yerushalayim? Well, you can go to my friend's website. It's called Fun in Jerusalem and everything for kids for any time is there. So that's my recommendation. I see somebody's asked me a very topical question. Has any decision been made on cable car? Yes, it has this morning and it's approved. So I'm very excited that this is a very interesting tourism infrastructure project, a green project that'll get more tourists into the old city in a greener way and not choke the old city with traffic and pollution. So we're very, very happy that after many objections and many people pulling it down, we succeeded at getting it through. Beautiful. Um, you know, if we're already talking about that, there was also a, an initiative to maybe build some kind of a, like a, a very skyscraper building that was like the, in the Emirates, um, in Kiryat Yovel. Is it still? Oh. Yeah. Oh, never heard of it. Uh, look, um, on every um, train line, we have, uh, we have uh, massive building rights. And in the non-historic neighborhoods, you know, why not? Uh, you know, we have to be respectful of the heritage of the city, but in neighborhoods that have zero historical value, uh, we need more housing. We need young people to be able to afford to live in the city. So uh, like I said, as long as we are, um, we are um, loyal to our heritage and our, um, the character of the city, you know, we should be able to build. I'm not sure Burj Khalifa high, but uh, certainly 30 or 40 stories down uh, Deir Hebron all the way to Gilo is something that is in, in, in the planning. So really, how do you find the balance between like trying to, you know, get, get people like building more, um, more um, neighborhoods, um, getting into like building more buildings, but on the other hand, making sure that, you know, we're not, we're remaining this, uh, old romantic Jerusalem that we all have in our imagination, you know, this, or maybe there is no balance. Maybe we're just, you know, pushing but ahead. City, to city regulation is where the balance is at. Um, and we enforce that regulation. And so nobody can do whatever the hell they want here. You know, it takes years to get building permits. And there's reasons for that because there's a lot of things to consider. 
Um, and so, uh, and so that's how we keep a balance. We legislate, we pass laws, and we make sure people stick with it. Fair enough. Okay. Flair, I want to thank you very much for this really interesting and, you know, eye opener for me at least, um, you know, about Jerusalem and about how, how where's Jerusalem going? Um, it was really interesting. And thank you all for watching and asking great questions. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you to mark Sunday 19th of June in your calendar. That's the next Better Faith Conversation. We'll be speaking with Ellen Johnson. Ellen Johnson is the non-Jewish founder and the editor of Fathom, the online journal of the British Israel Communications and Research Center, known as BCOM. Fathom is one of the most respected journals focusing on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with regular contributions from thinkers on all sides of the dispute. Professor Johnson worked with the UK Home Office from 2008 to 2010, tracing the journeys taken by young British Muslims into and out of the extremism and developing communication strategies to center radicalization, to counter radicalization. Professor Johnson will be speaking to us about the global smear campaign against Israel and what we can do to fight it. He's really engaging and really smart, and it will be a treat to introduce him to Australian audiences. We will send out information closer to the date and look forward to seeing you in June. Until then, thank you again, Claire. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening in Australia, and it's always lovely to talk to Australians. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>